Drawing on the analysis of Japanese voice actors or seiyuu, in this presentation, I would like to propose a new concept, and I would like to call it the seiyuu-esque. By seiyuu-esque, I refer to states, processes, and qualities pertaining to the layering of semiotic agency and attachment. Just as in voice acting, where fan attachment and professional skills get produced in the gap between characters and seiyuu, the concept of seiyuu-esque applies when the locus of agency and attachment is constitutively displaced and effaced, when such effacement itself becomes a site of pleasure and labor. Let me start by drawing your attention to two Japanese expressions, naka no hito and urakata, as I think they help us better understand seiyu's topology. The subcultural idiom of naka no hito, or person inside, is often used to refer to seiyu in relation to the characters they help animate. It configures the character as an outer skeleton, an empty body, like a kigurumi costume. And the seiyu is seen as a human operator who hides her own body in this empty vessel to animate it from inside. Urakata, on the other hand, is a relatively more general term referring to any sort of backstage work, a hidden agentive force that is usually not featured in the effect it helps to bring about. It is the labor of naka no hito. It is a work that is pushed outside or hidden beneath the work itself, as it were, but which nonetheless is a condition of possibility of the work itself, a kind of relationship that Derrida would describe as perergon. So, our takeaway point here is this. The seiyu's labor of characterization is a supplementary work, precisely in the Derridian sense of the term. It is worth noting that the idiom of naka no hito has further metaphorical extension in which it is used to emphasize the socio-technical relation of operation or delegation, which may have nothing to do with voice or acting. For example, a person or persons managing a corporate Twitter account are characterized as a naka no hito of that account, or a team of web designers are said to be a naka no hito of that website. Our dear symposium organizer, Agnes Jr may be said to be a naka no hito of this symposium, and we are all indebted to her hidden rakata labor, along with many other people's labor, that makes this collective work possible. Of course, besides being a urakata operator, Agnes is also a figure on stage as she also performs her presentation, like I'm doing here. Meanwhile, you may configure this very presentation I'm giving in a similar way, in which case, I will be the naka no hito of this presentation. I animate my argument in the same way a seiyu might animate a character. I am not suggesting that certain types of social actions involve naka no hito and others do not. Rather, I am arguing that using expressions like naka no hito to describe social, uh, social actions indexically invokes a way of thinking about relationality that I am here calling seiyu-esque. It is an invitation to look at social life as consisting of absences and gaps. It is a way of appreciating the value of effacement and dislocation, layering and covering. In cases such as voice acting or presentations like this one you're hearing, the gap is created through technologies of disembodiment that ensure a chrismatic separation between voice and body, sound and its displaced source. There are elaborate ways in which seiyu create and maintain such a gap through what I have called effacement work, an art of characterization through which seiyu seek to maintain themselves as a person inside, in order to sustain the animation or ensoulment of their character from within. In the rest of my presentation, I draw on the case of virtual YouTubers or VTubers to explore how such a gap indexes seiyu-esque topology as it transpires in a space that is neither simply outside nor simply inside, a space that is constitutively relational, emerging as it does between different layers of agency, between virtual and actual, between different layers of virtuality. The phenomenon of VTuber is gaining wide public recognition today. For more detailed explanation, I defer to some of our fellow contributors to the symposium who have given us insightful discussion. In my presentation, I limit myself to explore only a few general points. 
rather than following mass media narratives that often treat VTubers as spectacles. My aim is to explore modes of characterization and forms of participation as reflexively developed and deployed by VTubers and their fans in their habitual, everyday engagement. VTubers perform a wide variety of activities, pretty much everything a typical YouTuber would do. But in contrast to typical YouTubers, who often foreground their own body and face as part of their online presence, and embody what P. David Marshall calls the presentational mode of the contemporary media experience. What unites the VTubers, whether they are individual pr practitioners or belong to a a corporate networks, is, by definition, the art of effacement, the figuration of a character separated from the human operator who animates it from within or from behind. Understandably, discussions of VTubers often focus on their visual aspect, but it is as important to explore the significance of voice. Voice is a semiotically potent actant that mediates between VTubers and their fans. Indeed, it is worth noting that the VTuber fans are often casually described as listeners, which, in this Japanese rendition, is more specifically an interdiscursive allusion to radio listeners. Some of the more conversation-oriented VTuber streaming programs are indeed called radio sessions. Like voice acting, VTuber culture remediates radio culture. Let me introduce some of the expressions commonly used in VTuber culture to illustrate its resonance with voice acting. The naka no hito of a VTuber, that is a human operator to whom their characterized voice is specifically attributed, is often described as tamashi, or soul. In turn, the soul is seen as inhabiting the interior of an avatar, an empty vessel for ensoulment. A slightly specialized term, gawa, is also used, referring to a visible outer part of something. Many VTubers have multiple versions of relatively stable avatar appearance, and each of these would be called their gawa. The process of acquiring a gawa that is the process of becoming a VTuber, is called Juniku, or Incarnation. Interestingly, the spiritualist reference intersects with the kinship idiom of reproduction, in which the illustrator, or model creator, who designs the gawa, is commonly called the mother of the VTuber. Sometimes a mother would look for a soul to help animate their as yet ensouled gawa in a public call for souls, as often found in Twitter and other social media with the hashtag Tamashi Boshu, which often specifies criteria regarding desired qualities of the voice. The spiritualist implication is also observed in the expression Zense, one's previous life. This term refers to the life of the Naka no Hito before they become incarnated as a specific VTuber. It indexes the collective awareness of a temporal gap between the incumbent incarnation of a soul and its previous ones. I want to make two general observations here. First, the relation of incarnation between Gawa and Tamashi, the vessel and the soul, is highly flexible and sometimes even plainly disjunctive. In one of her horror game live streaming sessions, VTuber Shina Yuika got so scared at one of the game's climatic scenes she, or her tamashi, literally left her vessel. That is, she actually moved away from the motion capturing device, which left her gawa frozen for a while, momentarily de-ensouled. This was particularly funny to the listeners because this happened at the moment in the game where the player character encounters an ominous phenomenon which prompts the character to flee the scene. Examples of this sort of disjunction abound in VTuber culture, and it is regularly observed and remarked upon by its participants. Second, some VTubers or their tamashi are known to have participated in various online and offline cultural activities in the past, in different capacities, with different names. Here, there is a complex dynamics regarding the public knowledge about these past lives similar to what sociologists call public secrecy. That is, even when information about different incarnations 
is widely circulated, there often is a collective orientation to treat it as if it is a secret. Perhaps one extreme manifestation of such orientation may be seen in the case of VTuber Inuyama Tamaki. His Naka no Hito, or soul, is widely known to be manga artist Tsukudani Norio, who is also the mother who created the gawa for Tamaki. We know this because he openly says so himself. And yet, this admission of the truth of identity is only a foil to a rather exquisitely playful process of effacement. In one instance, Tsukudani hosts a live streaming session where she invites Tamaki, the VTuber. The artist and the avatar take turns in a conversation. But of course, it is plainly clear to everyone that it is Tsukudani who is voicing and operating Tamaki. I mean, you can literally see her doing that. During this session, she occasionally gets quite clumsy in her attempt to maintain even a semblance of deception. So much so that it is the listeners who come and try, but mostly in vain, to help sustain the pretense that the identity between the two figures is supposed to be a secret, which they know it is not. Tsukudani is not Tamaki, but she also is Tamaki. They are different, but they are also the same. This little episode nicely demonstrates the, the nature of Seiyu's topology, a space that is neither simply outside nor simply inside, like Klein's bottle. This is all to say, the gap persists. It becomes a point of mediation around which actions are performed and ex interpretations exchanged. Rather than seeking to erase the gap between different incarnations and unite them into a coherent unidirectional character and vita, the collective orientation to public secrecy in vitro culture seeks to maintain the gap, even when everyone knows it is possible to collapse it. It should be recalled for voice actors, say you, their actual world identity is in most cases not a secret in the sense of prohibited knowledge, but they are capable of going unnoticed in the very moment when their work of characterization counts. VTubers today inhabit a collaborative ecosystem, working as groups and units within and across different corporate and non-corporate communities. This collaborative tendency is increasingly visible in the past year, where the number of VTubers is rapidly increasing, which in some estimate has now reached 10,000. Here, I would like to draw an analogy to contemporary Japanese idol culture, which also has witnessed a salient emphasis on group-based socialization in the last 20 years or so. Just like in idol culture, affective attachment is not simply nurtured between an individual VTuber and an individual listener in a dyadic relation, but it develops in relation to a relation among VTubers, forming a triadic structure of relationality or meta-relationality. For example, again very similar to idol culture, tracing the history of franchises like Hello Project, the meta discourses of VTubers often emphasize the idea of cohort based relationality or senior junior relationality. Niji Sanji VTubers exhibit this tendency perhaps most clearly. Fan attachment is often triggered by such relational dynamics that emerges in the space among VTubers. Indeed, this meta discourse of relationality sometimes explicitly borrows the language of Yaoi BL culture in its topology of desire based on character couplings. Fans' attachment is a relation to a relation. They affectively respond to a gap, the moment of contradiction and resonance, friction and interpenetration, encounter and near encounter. Consider the idiom of Moe which Patrick Gabbard has insightfully explored as an affective response to characters. If that idiom embodies the zeitgeist of late 1990s and early 2000s, today we find a somewhat equivalent idiom that is in wide circulation, totoi, precious or revered. Often the expression totoi is explicitly addressed to a relation between characters or between any more inducing entities. We should know that there is even a phonological variant, tete, that specifically indexes the culture of VTubers. 
it is widely acknowledged that this variant form traces back to a fan art that depicts affective relation between two Niji Sanji VTubers. We might argue that the idiom of totoi, or tete, clarifies what is already the essence of moe. That is, it suggests that the attachment and pleasure of characterization is fundamentally meta-relational. Such affective sensibility to relationality is dynamically figurated in concrete moments of the everyday life of VTuber culture. One very common mode of their practice today is multi-party gameplay, where multiple uh, VTubers participate in real-time interaction in games such as PUBG, Project Winter, and ARK. Here, let me explore how VTubers belonging to the Nijisanji community participate in Minecraft, the famous sandbox game. Minecraft's generally open-ended and non-narrative structure offers these Nijisanji VTubers, as well as their fans, with the virtual architecture of sociability where they can engage prolonged and often impromptu interactional and collaborative play. Now, in this instance, we have a compound layer of Seiyu-esque effacement, because not only are the VTubers already embedded in the layer of their own gawa, they also are game players in the Minecraft world, operating their in-game character whose skin is designed in the manner of their own gawa, that is, in the pixelated version of their gawa, as consistent with the Minecraft aesthetics. There being a naka no hito of their Minecraft avatar. I would like to analyze a short clip of Ninja Sanji Minecraft gameplay, but before doing so, let me take a short detour to review a set of expressions. Today's VTuber creative content largely comes in the form of live streaming sessions, or namahaishin, in addition to pre-recorded uh, video works. One practical consequence of the rapid increase in the number of VTubers is that there are now so many live streaming sessions happening all the time, and listeners as well as VTubers respond to this situation by developing multiple space times of participation. The following contrastive framework is often suggested especially regarding the communities of corporate VTubers. On the one hand, the expression honpen, or sometimes more simply haishin, is used to refer to the original live streaming or video content, uh, which in many cases are archived in their original form. On the other hand, we identify a, a citational discourse known as kirinuki, or excerpt. These kirinuki videos are created by dedicated fans but sometimes also by VTubers themselves. VTuber culture proceeds both synchronously through live streaming sessions broadcast on specific channels and asynchronously through Kirinuki citations of those sessions. Far from being mere reproductions, however, Kirinuki videos are often highly elaborate recontextualization of the Honpen content, exhibiting signs of great curatorial skills and deep connoisseurship. Given the condition of oversaturation of live streaming content, in many respects it is this dialectics between the homepage content and such kirinuki curation that shapes processes of circulation in VTuber culture. Kirinuki citationality, the gap it creates between different tempos of participation, functions as a crucial mediator that enables and underwrites communication among participants within the larger media ecosystem. Now, returning to Minecraft, the listener's experience of VTuber Minecraft gameplay is structured precisely through such a citational gap between Honpen and Kirinuki. The following clip is taken from a Kirinuki curated by a fan, which focuses on an otherwise rather uneventful moment in the everyday life of Nijisanji Minecraft server, featuring three VTubers, Kanae, Leon, and Debbie. Kanae, なんか妖怪を押して。押して、押して、押して。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで。ね、ボタンで
やってるこれ落ちたのものまねするのわ<笑>かんないよこっちあねこれものまねしてくれるけど僕がものまねするのしかもものまねするかクソルマなんだけど<笑>ハリー・ポッターからドビーはおしがりだな。いや、お前やろが。おしがりだな、じゃねえんだよな。欲しがってないから。全然欲しがってないんだよ。There actually is quite complex participation framework at play here. But first, let us note that why Rion and Debbie are sharing their visual as well as audio communication with each other, the third player, Kanae. Here, seen bottom left, does not have any audio access to either of the two. He is streaming on his own channel separately. Here's what happens in this clip In the Minecraft world, Kanaya just happens upon a place where Rion and Debbie have just created a little house, which is not really a house but just a pair of beds surrounded by a bunch of flowers. Right next to the bed, Kanaya finds a little lever. Which simply says, Monomane Leva, impersonation lever. Kanae feels prompted to turn it on, which he does, but nothing happens because it is a fake lever, not connected to any process. It's just a little comedic prompt set up by the mischievous pair of Rion and Debbie, and Kanae sort of immediately realizes that this is supposed to be a cue for him to perform an impromptu Monomane impersonation. Which of course means voice impersonation in this instance. Meanwhile, the moment when Rion and Debbie see Kanae pulling the lever, they get excited and start wondering if he will get the meaning of it. Of course, they have no way to know because their audio is not connected to Kanae. They're just looking at him standing still by the bed,、uh, apparently thinking what to make of this situation. At this moment, Rion and Debbie make several interdiscursive moves. First, they immediately start referring to archives, suggesting their interdiscursive awareness that they will be able to check whether Kanae followed their prompt by watching his archive streaming later. Second, Rion and Debbie start looking at live comment feeds on their own channels and pick up listener comments that testify that Kanae is in fact performing his monomani. He does a voice of a Harry Potter character here. That is, some listeners are viewing the three or at least two live sessions simultaneously and reporting what is happening in one to the participants in the other. A similar sort of listener reportage is also happening in Kanai's、uh, channel as well. When he is still unsure about what to do, we see comments on his feed that tell him, quote, They're saying you are supposed to do more no money if you pull the lever. End quote. This type of reporting listeners are called hato or denshopato, messenger pigeons. Messenger pigeons are another important mediating link that affects the communicative relation among VTubers. Sometimes their activities result in negative interference, as for example in the case of revealing、uh, game spoilers. This mediating dynamics of denshopato. Is worth an entirely separate analysis in and of itself. The text of Kirinuki, of course, serves as a medi- mediator as well, as it recontextualizes the whole participation framework onto another context, creating a different set of audiences and optics. My point here is this there is collective orientation to render the whole communicative process not completely transparent. If Kanae wanted clear communication, He could have simply checked Rion and Debbie's channels himself, rather than relying on the crowd of pseudonymous Denshobato. It is worth noting that even though Minecraft comes with its own in game chat function, Nizu Sanji VTubers often make effort not to rely on it too much, 
or simply end up not using it very much. Rather, they allow moments of miscommunication to continue unresolved to some extent, which lure further participation and interpretation from the listeners. The orientation to communicative opacity is not random. It is observed in a pattern way in many of the interactions during their collaborative play more generally. Just as in the case of voice acting or the case of Beach of the Souls, it is as though there is a concerted collective effort to create and sustain a secret, a CUS gap in knowledge, even when its revelation, the truth, can be readily available. Indeed, some listeners rejoice in those moments of near encounter and not so perfect encounter. What is the nature of desire in the kind of socio-technical metamorphosis we see in cases like feature of culture? Through the lens of the CUS, we may be able to construct an effective critique of what might be called compensatory model, which sees desire in the last analysis as a lack that is only designed to be compensated for by a substitute. The hegemonic interpretation of characters often falls prey to this way of thinking, seeing characters as merely a simulated substitute, merely an immaterial sign of a so-called real social relation in a person. Anthropologist Matthew Hall observes that, quote, anthropologists have long recognized that things are signs, but until recently they have often ignored that signs are things, unquote. The compensatory model of desire presupposes this dichotomous semiotic ideology, which would understand Vichuba Gawa, for example, merely as a sign, an image of desire, not a body that matters. It would surveil the body of the character only to peel away its complex layers one by one and demand to know the true location of a soul by fixing its agency to a naked body. But the habitual way in which participants in virtual culture rejoice in and struggle with the layers of agency created by multiple incarnations and multiple souls should offer a critical alternative to such a hegemonic model of desire.